start off tonight's evening, uh, we have with us an exceptional, exceptional speaker for a very impressive technology. Um, our speaker this evening has managed large research projects for the U.S. intelligence co community. He was formerly the principal scientist for MITRE Corporation, where they did critical protocol analysis and automated defense cyber resource, or cyber response. Heavy duty stuff, brainy stuff. Uh, on top of that, he was also the key contributor to the technology that enabled the rapid growth of Akamai. Everyone know Akamai here? Akamai, sure, sure, okay. Um, so please welcome tonight, uh, tonight's guest, the CTO of Astro Technology, Technology <laughs> Justin Xi. Database 
monoculture, right? And all those databases that we're now used to all the time that all share that one model, each of them in their own way are pretty darn good. It's that they all make the same choices. And they don't always need to make those same choices. And sometimes some of the benefits of those systems come with some costs that are unacceptable, like they were for Amazon time. And so that idea is really what I think is no secret, is this notion of you know, the industry sort of became too much of a monoculture, and it's, and it's opening up again now. People are realizing that they can make different choices. Will they always make ones that are going to last and matter historically? No. Some of these systems, someone will build them, and it'll last for a couple of years, and eventually it won't find a niche and will die off. That's fine, right? This is a healthy behavior that we have going on right now. And it's pretty exciting for me anyway. Um, I think some of these systems will have a lasting change. I've made my bet on one of them, but you know we're just going to have to wait and see. But I, mean, I am going to talk about React a little bit today, but I'm not going to talk about all of its features. I'm just going to use it as an example, because what I really want to talk about is failure. Um, Eric mentioned a little bit of my own personal history, and one way to describe all those things more simply than naming places I've worked and things I've worked on is distributed systems that actually had to keep doing things when unknown parts are breaking. Um, and this is becoming a bigger and bigger deal to more and more developers. Right? Sooner or later, almost all of you will be building a distributed system, whether you know it or not, whether you want to or not. And so you're going to have failures in your system. And this is about awareness of how you can build with that in mind instead of dealing with it afterwards. And the fundamental understanding is based on the fact that we all, you know, all of us that are software developers tend to live in this world that's a little too perfect, right? That code is, is nice and clean, right? hopefully, but can be. And we can think in abstractions. But everything we do, even if we wrote code without any bugs, which none of us do, is running in an imperfect physical world. And so understanding that the things we build are not going to behave perfectly when they're in the face of reality and production and customers is really the thing I want to talk about. And the only way you can be responsible to yourself, to your company, to your customers, is to know how your system will degrade when those failures happen. Because um, you can either plan on this, right? Like you're all building a distributed system these days. If you're building anything on the web, almost any applications, you can start out planning, thinking about how your system will work when it's broken, which isn't very fun. But it's pretty important, right? Because the question is, would you rather that you figure out how your system degrades first, or would you rather have Hacker News figure it out first? Right? Those are your only choices. It's not nobody. And things rarely break cleanly. The question is, how can you make things degrade in a way that you can still be extracting success from a system that's failing in its parts? And we have a tendency, when we build things, to think that we know which parts of those things <laughs> are going to break. Right? Well, oh, well, this is the scary part of my code. I'm going to put extra exception handling around it. Or, you know, we, we'll, oh, well, that service over there, I, Joe wrote that. I don't really trust Joe. So I'm going to, you know, write my all kinds of defensive things around the way I use that. And we assume that some of the other things that we know well won't break as much, and we trust some things more than others in our systems. And we're actually not very good at that kind of judgment. Um, this tool that I trusted is actually in Bash's office. And that was not the, oh, you can't see because the lights are so bright. It's a hammer. Can, yeah, you'll see it in a minute. Um, but the, the real lesson is that you're not going to guess correctly in those cases. Yeah, well, there you go. I did not expect that to happen. That was very surprising. Um, and it's still around as a reminder that don't make those assumptions. Don't assume that you're going to be right about this. If you were going to be right about that, you wouldn't have made the part the first place. So I don't mean this to be a downer. What I'd rather do is say, look, this will happen. Can we come up with a way of thinking about it and get there? It turns out. We don't have to invent ways to think about things like this. There are already a bunch of frameworks for talking about partial fit. Just as an example, I'm going to talk about one of the ones that I like. It's called Harvest 
can yield. Um, right on. Um, Eric Brewer and Armando Fox came up with this one. Uh, famously later, Eric tried to give a simpler version of this in a keynote that later got called the Cap Theorem. And we all know from you know this dozen plus years, or, yeah, over a dozen years since then, how simple that was, and how many discussions that prompted. But harvest and yield is a way of describing partial failure, and it's actually a pretty simple idea. And it's these two properties of an overall system that are tied to each other. And what they are are fractions or probabilities of success during failure conditions. We think about two different things we'd like to be true about our system. One of them is, first off, let's generalize and say that the system is one that responds to requests. It's a request response system. Hopefully that's not too specific. I think most of us have built something that I'm still general enough for. That for a given request, how much of our most current, consistent, correct data is seen to respond to that request? In other words, if something's stale, that doesn't count as current. If something's not present, that doesn't count. How much? So this should you know, always be 1 or 100%, depending on how we represent it. Right? You always want to be able to look at the most current, most complete version of your database at any given time. Yield is this other factor, which is, for a given request, what's your probability that you're actually going to be able to respond to it in whatever your acceptable amount of time is? Or seen as a probability, right? Or sorry, seen as a frequency, it's how many of your requests over whatever your total is you'll correctly respond to. You also want this to be 100%. Great, they're 100%. The whole point of this talk is things break. And the interesting result that Eric and Armando had is that the best case scenario that you can have, I want to generalize our system a little bit more and have it be homogenous for the moment, so it's made up of equal parts. You can fudge to fix that later. Is that harvest and yield are in constant tension. So if something reduces one of them, at the best, to get that back without getting more resources, you have to reduce the other one. And the best case scenario you can have when things fail is a linear reduction of one of these things. I'll make it a little more concrete. Let's say we have a database with all of our user data and all of our sessions or whatever. And say it gets large and we shard it. We put it across four machines. And so now each of those four machines has 25% of our data. And I know we wouldn't normally want to do quite this simply, but it's easier. And so every request that comes in gets to look at all four. I'm not going to deal with the consistency part of the problem right now. That's a whole other talk. Um, but every request that comes in might have to talk to all four, but it can get to 100% of the day. 100% harvest. That's great. One of the machines goes down. Well, if we choose to have the system keep responding to requests instead of shutting everything down, we just went to 75% of harvest. Right? We can still respond to requests as long as we're willing to do it only seeing 75% of our current data. Yield, turn that on its head a little bit, instead of sharding this database, let's say we replicate it across all four of them. All four of our machines have all of our data. And we did that, let's say, to handle throughput. So now all of them are operating at peak capacity. They're responding to every request, but they couldn't even handle one more. I'm realizing a little bit, but the rest of this works, even if you're not that simple. And they're all doing that, and now one of them goes down. Well, unlike before, each machine had the whole database, so we're still at 100% harvest. But we can only respond to 75% as many requests. So we're 75% yield. And the idea here is that by losing one machine, the best possible case was that we could have 100% of one of these and 75% of the other. We have a linear reduction. And the idea with this particular framework is that you can start out planning a system, thinking about your priorities and what different failures of your system you'd like to have cost you one or the other of these. Because you don't get to say, well, I don't give up either one. You start out, if you're doing it responsibly, thinking about, yes, things are going to fail. How does the system behave then? And the interesting, to me, reason why I bring up this particular version of a way to think about failure is that everybody's been trained to think that harvest is the precious one of these. Right? This is what all these silly fights about eventual consistency and strong consistency and all this are, right? And why we've been trained to think that you have to see everything correctly, consistently, all the time. Don't be wrong, you want that. You want 100% of both of these, right? We've been and most of that database model culture that I was talking about, this is one of the fundamental trade-offs. Almost always, if you choose a database in the category that was the only category for most developers before five or six years ago, you build a system with 
Oh, is that harmless? Okay, that's pretty great. You've got that. That means every failure costs you yield. Yield is uptime. Yield is letting a customer give you money. A lot of the time, we might worship one of these so much that we lose track of the fact that we're being judged on the other one. This isn't to say, do it the other way. Always prioritize yield. It's not that at all. It's that you want all of these properties. And if you don't think about how you give up which ones when failures occur, then you're going to build a system that's worse than best and that surprises you in the ways that it fits. And you know, this is all just about the fact that, you know, like I was saying, you know, failures happen. You don't get to choose to not have them happen. You don't get to choose when they happen, or what order they happen, or what components they happen to. But if you start out thinking with a framework, doesn't matter if it's Harvard, Harvest and Yield or something else, you can predict how failures will occur so that you can have a predictable level of success, even when some things are failing. If you're wildly successful, like Amazon or Google or someone like that, you'll also notice that as your systems get big enough, there's actually no point at which some of them are failing. Right? This is just where the asymptotic behavior ends up, that things failing the more of them you have. Eventually, some parts are always failing. And it's nice to aspire to that. Most, most people aren't going to care about that. But long before you get to a level of hugeness where things are like that, you're still going to have surprising failures. And the failures might surprise you, but the goal is to have it so that your own system doesn't surprise you at that time. And so what you want to get that predictable success, and what we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk, is resilience. I tend to use the word resilience on this topic instead of some of the other words people use, like reliability or robustness. Because some of those other words, to me, kind of things not fail. And I'd instead like to talk about systems that get up and keep running when things fail. So, <laughs> resilience is what we're going to talk about. And we're going to use React as an example to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about every feature, every API, all these things React does. You can ask me or Tom or Bill or any of the rest of us anytime. We're on IRC, we're on mailing list. Second, you can do that. It's more fun to talk about something like resilience and just use React as an example. Quickly, though, since not all of you might be familiar with it, here are some post words about React. <laughs> React's a database. It's an open source database. It's a distributed database in a really true sense. Not like you can make MySQL or Postgres or any of these things distributed in the ways that people have done pretty well over the years. But it's designed from the get-go, such that a database is not something that exists on a single machine, it exists on a cluster. And its big goals are availability and scalability, and that's what people come to us for. So, this is certainly a topic I can talk a lot more about, but I don't want this to be a here's my product talk. I get bored by those, maybe you do too. So instead I'm going to talk about things blowing up. First, fun one. Simple one. Someone flips a switch, right? You're running a database, let's, let's for a moment not be a distributed system yet. Doesn't matter whether it's React, MySQL, name your favorite database. Someone flips the switch. Well, there are some databases, hopefully most of you aren't using them, that uh, store their, that simply modify data in place without doing any other mechanisms to manage it when updates occur. And if that occurs, well, guess what? If you reboot during an update in place in the middle of a database, everything could potentially be lost and corrupted. Luckily, most of the database world figured out a few decades ago that that's not okay. This isn't one that you need anything particularly advanced to deal with at a minimum. And so we see things like journals and write ahead logs that most databases these days at least have an option to do, even if you choose to turn it off to go faster, at least then it's your problem. Um, but there's a little problem with this, which is that databases are usually really hungry for IO, right? They're all about managing data on a disk. I mean, except all the memory databases, they're not databases, they're a different thing. Um, and so now if I add a journal, I've now got two things, my journal and my main memory store, my main storage of data, that are both competing for my rights. So there's another technique. Again, we certainly didn't invent this or almost any of these techniques. I'm just using this as an example. It's been around for a while, which is this notion of log structured storage. And it's this cool realization that really started out as log structured file systems. And there are now a bunch of things out there. Uh, one of them is Bitcast, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, which is the default storage engine underneath React. 
Um, but there's plenty of others out there that are log structured stores. And the idea there is if I'm going to have to write out this log, this journal of everything, in order to be safe, in order to be able to restart my database without losing something in the middle, why not structure that log so that it can be the database? So that I'm no longer competing with something else. To write something that's really just keep appending my records. Right? This is basically what the inside of a main bitcast file looks like. You just append, you know, your checksum, your timestamp, your key, your value, boom, it's a row, store, go. And this isn't the journal, it's the journal and the database. Now, I mean, of course, for it to really be a database, you need indexes and all these other things. But the cool thing is all the rest of this stuff can be created out of this. And the canonical store simply is the journal. And the neat thing about that idea, which is in a few other systems as well, is again, you get all the advantages of having a journal without having two different subsystems competing for all your IO. So that's pretty neat. So if we write out these things at the end, we can restart and we just still have our database. What if we had only written part of them? What if we failed <coughs> while we were writing out one of those rows, one of those records? Now it turns out that's actually pretty hard to do with modern disk firmware, because the way writes usually get sent to a disk, it's actually pretty hard to write half of a write call actually get written. It's possible. Weirder things have happened. Um, and so we'd like to see how we could figure out that, that even happened and make it not destroy us. Well, this one's pretty straightforward, and it comes with really, really general purpose advice. Uh, you might have seen when I was pointing at those records in BitCast if there was a CRC at the beginning. The real piece of advice here is check some more than you think you have to. Um, you're probably somewhere in, if you're whether you're implementing a database, using a system that transfers records from one machine to another, anything like this, somewhere in that system you're almost certainly doing some sort of a checksum or hash sum or something like that. You're not doing enough of them. Do more. Um, that's how you can verify this sort of thing. If I look at one of these half written records, I can look at it very quickly and see, first off, maybe it's not even long enough to be a valid record. But if it's longer than my checksum length, I can look at the checksum, look at the rest, and boom, ignore it. Now, the only way we got rid of that and decided not to care about it in BitCast is just a very simple trick, which is it will only ever open a given file for writing one time ever. So when you restart BitCast, it'll still use old files for reading. But during that run, it'll only write to new ones. But one of the little side effects of this is if we did shut down during a write, that record's also the last record. So we don't have to worry about the, the next piece and the next piece. We can just get to the end, it's corrupt, well, that's just garbage, but we're moving on. Um, we do actually have ways to check if there's a corrupt record in the middle, but it's even harder to actually make that happen, because that's a different problem. Um, so, by invalidating only the record at the end, we don't have to lose much data, right? Even if we couldn't possibly have saved that one time. Now, we're talking about BitCast so far as the example. BitCast is what a lot of people refer to as an embedded database, meaning you don't talk to it over a network or anything like that. It's not an application. It's more like Berkeley DB or something like that that you use inside some other system, a database or otherwise. And so, you know, normally you draw, you don't have to actually be able to read it, some sort of a stack like this. Although it would be nice if you could read it, but I can't make it right. Um, BitCast, the point is, it's this bit at the bottom, right? It's our storage engine. The rest of that's React. That's a React server's stack, right? It's the way everyone draws their software architecture stack. Um, but BitCast is one part of a fairly large piece of software. Um, and I talked before about how we, we try to figure out what's going to break and we write code to handle it, right? And then the typical thing that many of us do, right, bugs can happen anywhere, right? Any part of this whole system can have bugs and like any reasonably complicated piece of software, particularly server software, there's lots of interdependencies. There are things that affect other things. And we could write code the way most people do, which is everywhere that we interact with any other component, write tons of exception handling. Test everything for success and failure. This is standard good practices, right? Check everything for possible failures and exceptions. This is what you get taught to do. I happen to think that that's an incredibly backward way to program. It makes your software much harder to read because you can't just read what it's supposed to do. You have to read that intermingled with what happens when different things are failing. And it starts out with an idea that's fundamentally wrong, which is that the person writing the code is capable of enumerating the ways it will break. If that was the case, you wouldn't have needed to do all that work. So we use a different model. And part of this is made way easier by the fact that, Erlang is written, that React is written in Erlang, although there are other ways to do this with 
without such a weird programming language as the one we happen to like. Um, and it's called Let It Crash, or the Supervisor model. And the idea is that almost all of your code, you write as though everything works perfectly. In fact, it's, a set, it's implying assertions on almost every line. It's basically saying, please blow up if everything doesn't work perfectly. It's the opposite of writing all those exception handles. The thing that makes this OK is that each unit of code that does that, and you do have to structure things fairly thoughtfully for this to work, is running its own little lightweight process. And there's one other kind of lightweight process called a supervisor. And all it does is start those, start the workers, right? Every, all the rest of the work in the system, all the actual logic. And it notices when they crash. And all a supervisor does is it has a, a little strategy for knowing what to do when that happens. It can either just restart that thing, or it might say, oh, that thing has interdependencies with these other five things. I'll kill them too and restart the whole lot. And this leads you to build your software in such a way that it's fine, which takes a little bit of a shift in thinking. But it also means it lets you write much shorter, simpler, cleaner code that's able to catch bugs you couldn't imagine. Because you're not trying to write code for each of the bugs. You're saying, please execute as though everything's perfect. Just die, otherwise. And that's it. And this is a very nice, clean way to think about code. It's really helped us a lot. Um, it's a pretty weird technique if you haven't come across it before. Once you adjust to it, you get kind of upset at having to switch back to an arrangement where you can't do that. Um, but. That was just a little divergence about that style of coding. Back to the rest of this. What we really do with React I have the stack is we actually don't do it exactly that way. When it's running, it actually looks a little more like this. We run a bunch of instances of what we call V nodes, virtual nodes, little instances, essentially mini cooperating databases inside React. Part of that is if one fails, the you other know, might be you know, writing one piece of data, another can actually continue. And you'll see later how we use these different ones in response to some of the other failures. But it turns out that this technique is also really good for when we're adding and removing machines. So we'll do something like if you have you know, four machines, maybe each of them is running 16 of these VNodes. Well, if I want to double my cluster size and add four more, well, each machine will essentially give eight VNodes to another. And it's a very simple process, both in terms of code and in terms of being able to operationally understand the behavior. But still, this is a single server. And one of the things that I was trying to get across when describing React is we actually have to zoom out one level to think about React. React is a distributed database. One of those servers is not a React database. A React database runs on n React servers, more than one, usually more than three or four. And so we're now able to think about problems at a different scale. We could go across instead. I could talk about a dozen other ways that your embedded database can fail, your server software can fail. I think it's more fun to zoom out and think about one or two at each scale. So if we talked about what happened before, when we rebooted a machine during a record write, and I was talking about that half-written write, well, it was kind of sad that even though we could minimize it, we still lost that data, right? And on a single machine database, that's the best you can possibly do, right? If you write something and you turn off the machine before you're done writing it, you don't have that data. It's just that simple. But we can actually do better than that if we store multiple copies. And if we remember that the diagram or the logo for React actually is inspired by what React does, we store this data no matter where it comes in on multiple machines, typically three. I'm going to pretend it's always three for the rest of the talk, but you can actually choose. And if I do a quorum read and I ask for it, and I ask the three places that it belong, two of them have it, and they say, yep, here you go, here's your value. One of them doesn't have it, maybe because of that thing we talked about before. But we're going to say, and by the way, as a user, you can decide whether this is OK or not. This is all tunable. We'll still say, yep, OK, no value. <coughs> and so that one thing missing is invisible from the user's point of view. Or from the user's point of view, that, that right didn't fail. We got it. And it actually didn't matter why it failed, right? It could have been a bad checksum. It could have been something else. Again, we don't know what all the possible failures are. Whatever the failure was, it's OK. Now, if we had that happen, we have this failure that we're hiding. You might think that we don't want to just hide it, because what if we fail more? What if we fail in the wrong combination? Well, when React does this and hands this back, it has this neat technique called read repair. 
And the idea here is we know what the value ought to be, because we just decided from the core, from a majority of the others. So we'll send that value here and fix it. And so simply by interacting with the system, you help it heal. Now, that's all in the case of just you bounced the server, you had a bad record. What if the server was just plain down, right? Well, now that we're a distributed system, we actually need to talk about behavior when computers are turned off, right? When you talk about a single server system, you don't have to do that, right? If it's off, it's off. With a distributed system, you have to care. So we need to look at the system and how it works when some of these systems aren't behaving at all. They're not responding. So let's say it's that same machine. Well, the core read still helps us, right? Because we can still get two values, even if we didn't get this one at all. It doesn't matter if it's an error. But writes seem trickier, right? Well, yeah, only two of those machines are available. The user asked me to store it, expecting that I was going to store three copies. Well, in that case, we use this technique, and this is one of the things that I think was fairly original to the Dynamo paper, as opposed to most of the things in it, which were actually pretty well-known art that they just assembled in a pretty cool way, is this idea of sloppy quarrels, which is you just go to a deterministically chosen other machine. User says store three copies, store three copies. Even if you can't get to the three machines, it should belong. So now at the very least, I've satisfied my durability requirement. I've put that on disk in three places. Now the reason it has to be deterministic is we get this cool behavior, which is it works for reads too. When I do that request, I'll actually check in this other one, if this one's unavailable, and find this third copy and use it as one of the, one of the replicas that's valid for the purposes of the core. Now that's pretty cool if, say, after I wrote this data, one of the others went down. I can actually use this newly written value over here, even though it's not ideally at all. But these sloppy quorums are called that for a reason, right? What about when this machine comes back? And now all of a sudden, I've got three copies of these values. Right? Whatever this value is that I'm supposed to store, I've got three copies. Should be here, here, and here, but it's not in the right places. Well, this is one of the places where the V nodes from before help us. We use a technique called hinted handoff, which is that each of those V nodes, each of those virtual nodes, each of those sub storage engines on each machine, is also aware of whether the data that it's holding should be on this machine right now, or whether it's just there to do anything like what we're talking about here, sloppy forums or otherwise. Um, and periodically, if a React node notices that it has some data that it shouldn't really be the owner for, it'll look to see if the owner's reachable. And if so, it'll open up a channel and heal it. Cool thing is, this has a few other effects. This technique of hinted handoff to fix what happens after slot and forum also allows us to do things like not have any concurrency barriers or pauses when we change membership, we change which machines exist in the system. Right? Normally, a distributed system, one of the hardest problems is how do you deal with it when you change which machines are in? How does everyone know what the new role of every machine is at exactly the same time? Well, that's a lousy question. I don't want to have an answer to it. I want to know the answer. <coughs> so instead, if one of our clients or one of our servers thought that this was one of the homes for that data, and it sent it there, no problem. Any machine will accept any data, store it, meaning any data that could have been shipped into here, anything valid. And it'll then notice, as soon as it can, that, oh, the state of the whole cluster has converged on someone else being the owner for this data. And it'll open up that channel and send it there just as though that had happened due to the machine being dead. It's exactly the same technique. So, all right. Now, that's pretty cool. The machine's down, we're okay. What if the machines are up, but cosmic rays or other things <laughs> made our disk fall apart? You, someone yelled too hard at your server rack. Um, someone was mean to it. Disks flake out. If you have enough of them, eventually you'll notice that some of them don't just die. Some of them will actually have wrong data. And some of that can be helped if you're checksumming all your data and using different layers of your system to do that. But that doesn't actually stop the data from degrading. And this is another one of those things where the more systems you have, the likelihood of seeing this on some of your machines starts to go very sharply eventually. And 
that's what a couple minutes ago. That'll help you fix the data when you go look at it. But if you have a lot of data and you're not looking at all of it all the time, some of it just is allowed to get old. What if, in a system like this, part of one of your replicas is something degraded, a year later part of another one did, a year later part of the third one did, and you'd never read it during any of that time, you couldn't have read it prepared by data. Well, we don't want you to lose that data either. And so the technique that we use there is this notion called active anti-entropy. And that's in contrast to things like read repair, where the cluster is passive. It's not out fixing itself. But when you ask it to go look at something, if it sees that it can be fixed, it will active anti-entropy. It's something that REAC, and this is a relatively new feature in REAC, does all the time. Or each of these servers that knows it overlaps in ownership of one of these, and that it should own some of the same data, will keep a hash tree. So that if this machine has some data corrupt, and this machine has that same data uncorrupted, they'll periodically talk to each other over the network and do a fairly efficient navigation of the checksums of their entire data set. This is based on the ideas in a Merkle tree, is the way that you can efficiently do this. If you don't know what that data structure is, you can ask that question later. Um, or now, if you want to interrupt me, that's fine. Anyone who wants to ask a question anytime, we can have a conversation. Um, but the idea is that you can fairly efficiently find out which pieces of data you think should be the same, but are different. And then you can send each other that data and resolve it. And so this will allow the system to simply heal itself, even if no clients are looking at it. Um, this is a pretty big deal for people that have data that you know, has a large subset of the data that can be cold but you still are not okay with ever losing it. Now we got, yes? You have, I'll take this example that I gave. You have eight servers. How do you determine which three should hold this particular? Ah, thing? great question. So I, I intentionally initially ignored a whole bunch of how React works. So the, the basic technique is one called consistent hashing, which was actually first used at Akamai for location of web caches, or rather how to map a client browser to a web cache. And it's a pretty straightforward technique. It sounds kind of magical, but it's really just using the same fixed integer space, think the output of a hash function, for both the names of values. Here we can think about, we hash the keys, right? Put them in that space. And the names of locations, servers. So every key can be turned into a value in this range. Let's say two to the one six. That's a pretty convenient one, right? Um, and each of those v-nodes that I talked about before, each subset of this space that a server owns, well, we actually spread them out across that space. So each one of them owns an interval. So all we do is we want to decide where something should be. We look at the key, we hash it into that space, and we locally can keep pretty compactly a mapping of which servers own which partitions of that space. And we go to the next three. We go to the one that key falls in and the two after. But, one, one more bit. This is why it was key before when I said that we might have a briefly inconsistent view of membership. We don't have to update this all perfectly and consistently if we have a model like Hinted Handoff that lets us change this view of ownership and let our machines asynchronously transfer ownership to each other. Does that make sense? I know it's, it's kind of a fast explanation of this. Yes? So if you introduce a new node, the V node that you're going to query hasn't made it to the new Ubuntu instance yet. It'll sort of act like it's the machine is off and it'll move to the next one. Actually, no. That's actually this is the a thing that a lot of people that is the standard thing to assume when starting out. This it turns out to not work out very well. But you don't find that out until you build one of these things. Um, you don't want to do it dynamically. Um, if you figure out ownership dynamically, then you're shuffling data around all the time, and you're doing a huge amount of work you really don't want to do. So instead, when you add a node, we go through sort of a, an exchange protocol where one of the nodes will act kind of like a leader, but not in any uh, consensus-driven sense. We'll just have one node at a time will happen to be doing this process at most one. If we can't figure out which one, we'll wait. Uh, and we'll look at all the ownership right now, and we'll negotiate with all the others. And so if I add a node, Right, let's, let's say I've got 100 V nodes and 10 nodes now, just because that's easy math for humans, right? Um, and I add the 11th. 
then roughly each of the existing machines is going to end up giving up one of its VMs to be owned by the other one. One of the, in fact, reasons for consistent hashing is really two big reasons. One of them is to not have to move too much data when you change membership. The other one that's really key is that it's essentially zero hop routing. I don't ever have to ask any other node where something belongs. All I have to do locally is have that mapping of current ownership and hash into it. Yes? I have two questions. So I got I got a description of how you did, how you did hands off, but why would I choose these three? Why, why would I choose these particular three nodes as my storage for this particular data? Ah, so you don't. Okay. The, the user does not. So the next key you bring in, okay. in a way that is intentionally opaque to the user, might go to these three. Right? Okay. It's that the hash okay. with you know reasonably random distribution, right? This doesn't this isn't a crypto property, but it is a, 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 a probability property. Um, will send each key to a set of three nodes. Not the same set for all, right? Then these other nodes wouldn't be very worth having. We might have a three node database. So when I just set up, I just set up saying quorum is three or two yep. out of three. Yep. And oh, give it a list of machines. And give them the right. And you don't ever have to, as a user. This is one of the reasons I glossed over this. As a user, you don't pay attention to this mapping. You don't ever say what server to store a key on. And the reason I have this fourth one even pointed out is you can send your request to any server, and if it doesn't happen to be one of these three, it does all the Friday for you. All you have to do is say, in the case that you said where it's two out of three, a quorum of two out of three, that's the default. You don't even have to specify that if you don't want to change it. You just add machines. It's literally that simple. To add a machine to a React cluster, you install React on the machine, you type React admin, join the cluster. Go. Yes? Well, how would you create a data warehouse under that? I mean, do you have to specify which I mean, how, do you specify which records you want and then let it decide where they're going to be distributed or do you specify which server? So I should be pretty clear about the, the good fit use cases here. The short, thing, the short answer is some people use React for things that overlap a bit with what's traditionally data warehousing, which I think these days is blurring the way people use, well, they're all TP databases for lots of things. Um, so the short answer is React is not designed for the same things that a traditional data warehouse database is. And it is, you know, anything that's going to be good at, for instance, building an efficient data cube out of a star schema, doing all the things you're going to normally want to do to build a really high performance data warehouse, you actually probably don't want React for that. Um, React is really there for what I tend to think of as critical data. It's the data that, you know, it, it might not be your biggest data. It might not be the data that you need to run a really complicated report on every day. It's the data that when you can't read or write it, your revenue stream stops, right? Classic examples of this are things like user sessions and shopping carts, but there are many, many more, right? It's the data that's in your primary workflow. Most companies with a you know, revenue generating computing infrastructure these days don't just have one data system. <coughs> you know, almost everybody ends up polyglot these days. There are places that use just React and nothing else, and we love them, but <laughs> Most places out there are not going to do that, and sensibly. And the place where React is the sweet spot is for that critical data, where they really need high availability, and they really need to just be able to add machines. Yet, if you're trying too hard to figure out how React works as your data warehouse, you actually should use an existing, more aimed at the data warehouse problem product. And React is a pretty weak fit for that. So when you're saying high availability, you're talking about data that has is constantly more new data being added rather than data that's being constantly updated. I, I do mean both, actually. Uh, I do mean data that's being constantly updated or new. We see plenty of both. Um, that's really just but, a matter of... But uh, it's more transactional. Than, than it's much closer to transactional data than it is to an analytical model. Yes? Are you ensure good hash distribution? I'm sorry, I can't hear about it. Are you ensure good hash distribution? Use a reasonably modern hash function, that's all. Use what? A reasonably modern hash function, they all work. Even the ones that have crypto attacks against them, you know, the, a few of the hash functions in the past dozen years or so have very specialized pre-image attacks and things like that. Those are almost never because the hash doesn't have a generally good distribution function. Uh, you know, SHA-1, awesome. Way overkill. Way more than you need. Most hash functions available in your standard libraries and most programming languages these days that have you know, more than eight bits, 
We have some blood on it. Um, actually have a pretty darn good distribution function. You don't actually have to satisfy you know, a, a crypto assurance port to get a hash function way good enough for this. So yeah, it's really just the fact that that's, that's a problem that's already well more than enough solved that we don't have to do anything new there. Yes? Um, in this last setup that you have here, let's say the first two nodes receive the updates, but the last, the third node doesn't receive the update. So it might, it might look as if that node is out of date. Mm -hmm. So what happens in that case? Oh, right on. So do you mean when we get to the anti right. the active anti entropy? So what will happen is one of the nodes that has the data, doesn't matter which one, they'll all eventually do so. Okay. We'll talk to the node that's missing that piece of data. And I'm not right now, because I, I do actually have a little more stuff we can talk about, going to explain how everything about a Merkle tree navigation works. But it's a pretty cool data structure that lets you take a whole bunch of things you've hashed and verify subsets of those hashes matching. So first, they can test, do we have any differences? Most of the time, the answer will be no, and this is a very cheap operation if we just continue, right? Under normal operation where nothing's failing, this is very easy. And the idea is that this data structure lets you narrow down if the answer is yes to what the things are. And then we'll send them over to what was I saying? Any other questions on stuff I've said so far? Yes? From a security standpoint, if you break into the system, don't you have access to all the data? Yeah, so once this is definitely a system that, you know, has a you know soft chewy interior. Um, <laughs> you, you can put a lot of things in terms of exterior, but yeah, absolutely. Each of these systems is a peer, and this is a trusting peer-to-peer -peer system, not an untrusted peer-to-peer -peer system. Now, there's a lot of trade-offs there, right? You know, there's a lot you can do to build a system like this, and I'm pretty familiar with some of the techniques to make it work without the same degree of trust. Some of the techniques we've chosen in this particular case are trade-offs that make some of those internal to the cluster security problems harder in exchange for other things. That's, but you're absolutely right. This is not a system where you, by the way, when I talk about a cluster here, that's actually a perfect segue to what I'm going to do next. Last question for now. Um, <laughs> is when I'm talking about a cluster here, I'm talking about machines that are in the same data center. That are usually, although well, clusters can get bigger than this, in the same rack. Right? Most people don't run a cluster of more than about 20 machines, though there are definitely some that are much bigger. Um, but are certainly on local network to each other. And so it's not that that's not a concern, but it's a very different concern than if these were spread out across the internet for each other. So, to get to this, we zoomed out, right? First I talked about React as a server. We zoomed out, like, React is actually a distributed system. And now we're pointing out that this cluster is all in one database, but what if you want to deal with bigger things? Whole data center going there. Or there's other reasons. We're mostly talking about failure, but what if you just want your data to be close to your American users and your European users and your Indian users and so on? Well, we can zoom out one more time and run multiple clusters and make them aware of each other. And this is very different from what I just pointed out that we don't do, which is spreading out a cluster. And not, not just or even not primarily for that security reason, but because failures locally have really different properties than failures globally, right? The internet tends to work differently than your own single piece of Cisco here, right? They, they have different pros and cons in terms of failure modes. So the nice thing about setting up a React cluster, setting up another one, and then just telling them about each other, and you know, we can do things like use SSL and tunnel through a net and so on, so this is reasonably practical for most people as long as there's some way to route from one to the other is that these two clusters will now send data to each other. You can do it actually unidirectionally or bidirectionally, it's up to you. Is it going to be asynchronous? Uh, but each of these clusters is still independent. So the nice thing about that is if one of those data centers does go down, boom, um, which happens. It happens a bunch. Uh, and actually, we could just as easily have put the X here. That works fail all the time. <laughs> could have put one inside too. When we had that machine down before, I could have broken its line. Networks fail constantly. Um, in this case, let's simplify it say that it's the actual data center down. It doesn't matter much. Because these are still independent from each other, this one's still live, right? Even if they're cut off from each other, it's still reading right here. Leave it going. Now, if policy-wise, you'd rather not have to resolve that later, that's up to you. You don't have to let it go. The point is that this is a choice we provide you. Eventually, it comes back up. They synchronize and, oh, we get a lot of data to catch up. Oh, we'll catch up. And you can choose again, you know, operationally, at sort of the layer above this behavior of React itself, whether or not to make that 
system using React in that data center available right away or wait until you've caught up. Most people choose to make them available as much as possible. This is part of that harvest and yield trade off. Even if this data center comes up and it's a little bit out of date, I would rate, way rather be serving, you know, if this is a, you know, a social network for cats or something, right? I'd, I'd way <laughs> rather serve you a slightly out of date timeline and let you still upload pictures of your cat than make sure I don't let you do anything until I've got all my data from somewhere else, right? There are a lot of applications these days that would rather have that behavior and would rather boom, right back, right away, with that asynchronicity. Um, so this, you know, zoom out lets us deal with that class of failures, as well as, you know, letting, you know, American users put their pictures here and European users and so on. Um, and I grew up with two here. You can actually do an arbitrary set of these. We actually had one customer who admittedly is a little crazy, but he did actually have a mesh of 17 uh, clusters all synchronizing with each other. Uh, you probably don't need to do that, um, but the point is it doesn't have to be just two. Is a question? Um, can both be written to when the link's broken? Yep. So who resolves the conflict? Yeah, you do. Um, but we can help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me ask that seriously again. No, I'm going, I'm going to answer it seriously. Um, I just had to have a little fun first. Um, <laughs> unless everyone wanted to stick around for a whole other hour, I could do a whole different talk on consistency models and consensus and so on. The short version is React does not enforce the same kinds of consistency and atomicity and isolation guarantees that many people here probably got taught for how all databases work. Uh, it turns out that enforcing strong consistency in the sense that it would make what we're talking about impossible, right? Maybe these different things, while they're both up, uh, is roughly equivalent to choosing hurts and saying, I would rather have everybody have as uniform a view as possible. In exchange, I'm going to fail more often because I'm going to depend on being able to talk to more other systems. It's entire, both sides of this are entirely valid trade-offs. Most systems that are mature and robust actually make different sides of this choice at different scales. Uh, React, it actually turns out that it's not just at this scale. We also allow this even if you're only in one cluster, if you weren't scared enough by what we did already. Um, if you write to the same piece of data concurrently with two clients that actually do overlap, and so you write to those th same three nodes coming in a different order, and one of them gets to the first two first, and the other one gets to the third one first. You create that conflicting data, we basically have two choices. We can either do what many databases do, which is essentially say, no, and transactions, right? Let hold you back. Of course, I can queue up those things and keep retrying for you. But I don't actually know how long this behavior is going to go on. Or I can err on the side of availability and say, yep, let it in. Then what I have to do is answer the gentleman's real question, which is what happens then after we let two things right to the same data. It actually doesn't matter if you're in one cluster or in two. The difference is, when we're doing this at the wide area network, the window is wider. The amount of time during which that's possible is larger. But it's the exact same problem. And so we let you choose. There's a few different things you can do for resolution. Uh, one thing you can do is satisfy that yourself. You can actually say, store all the possible values and show them to me, the user. So when I do a get, I can get something that seems really, really weird to someone that thought databases work based on set theory and give you two different values. By the way, your database doesn't either. Um, uh, <laughs> two different values for that key and say, do what you want with them. I, you sent me conflicts, solve it. Please send me just one next time. And it turns out that there's actually a bunch of cases where that works out really neatly. Um, things like the shopping cart, which is a pretty canonical example of a system that often works this way. People seem pretty happy with set union, right? Which means I might lose a delete once in a while which means a customer might pay me a little more money than that. <laughs> Darn. That's a choice some people make. Um, you can also do what I think of as the typical MySQL model. Just let the last one win. How many of you actually use transactions around every right to all of your databases? Thought so. Right. So if you're not actually wrapping up everything you do with actual transactions, then what you do is you also allow things to write in conflict. You just don't know any of the times that it happens because all you did is lose half of them. That's what happens if you don't do that. 
These are the choices. So yeah, it's a little weird that we let you write conflicting data. None of the other choices are all that comfortable either. This is the one we make. Is that all? As I said, it takes a couple hours of discussion. I, you know, it's, it's, go, a, go it's a big topic. You know, going um, back to Land Weber and so forth. Ab and, absolutely. You know, it's a big topic, and there's not a single right choice here. And we're actually involved right now in some research uh, into a way to make the problem simpler for a lot of people. This kind of data structures that are actively friendly to that problem, called CRDTs, which you do have another in our talk, or QA. <laughs> um, which are data structures that are merge friendly your conflict friendly. And you can have things that look like sets and maps and integers. You can update, in fact, concurrently with no locks, no transactions. And it works out fine. And there's a pretty sound theory behind these things resolving themselves. Um, again, another big talk. But the nice thing is if you write your data into CRDTs, which some of our users do, and we're going to support more officially later, um, then this problem does go away because those updates will essentially resolve themselves. So the only other thing I was really going to talk about is a few people that have used React for some of these reasons. Uh, just a couple of examples of companies that have chosen to make some of the trade-offs we talked about instead of some of the more traditional trade-offs. And there's a lot of fun ones to pick. I just picked a few kind of arbitrarily. One of my favorites is not a company, it's a country. Uh, we're going to be able to add a much bigger country soon, I think. But for now, the flag I'm going to show you is Denmark. Um, and Denmark, it's amazing how much you can innovate on a nationwide system with a single payer system. But it's not that to a problem. I, yeah, we haven't done it, right? <laughs> um, but politics aside, they're able to actually have a database all kinds of security and privacy controls, that's not part of the problem we're talking about here, that actually has every citizen in the country's full health records. Every pharmacy prescription, every emergency room visit, every physician's visit. So that if you show up in a hospital unconscious, they know what you're allergic to, and they know what illnesses you have, and they can give better health care. The problem is having this kind of a database of everybody all the time in the whole country, well, if you put it in only one place, then all the hospitals and doctor's offices that might not have reliable internet to that one place right now are going to have a bad time. So they needed something that was going to work for all their citizens all the time. So they set up REOC in multiple data centers around the country in different regions. And health establishments can just talk to anyone. And so they chose this really because it's not OK to not have people data available to them. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. I can, just like all the technical choices we can make, I, I'm happy to talk about our customers all day, but I'm going to be quick about a couple of them. Yammer is another favorite one. I guess I can replace this logo with Microsoft now. They bought them a long ago. <laughs> made a few of our friends real happy. Um, but they were building a fundamental part of their infrastructure, which is where we see a lot of you know, our, our favorite customers are building sort of a layer just below a lot of their user facing stuff. In their case, it's their notification system, which is essentially the the queuing system through which everything tells everything else in Yammer how it works. And most of the rest of their system they started to have a handle on, but they realized that that one had become so integral that when it didn't work, nothing worked. And so it qualified as a sort of critical data I was talking about before, and they provide a service to a lot of big companies. Um, and it also turned out that because it was so integrated into everything, its latency magnified into other systems' latency. So if the latency of that system ballooned, that, that ballooning would be multiplied by a service that ended up accidentally calling the notification system three times. And so their ability to simply add more servers, in addition to the availability notion, to keep latency really flat was a big deal for them. The only other one I'm going to mention right now is Voxer. Voxer's pretty cool. Uh, I like it. Uh, it's an app for iOS and Android that essentially lets you have all the good things. And if anyone remembers the, the Nextel push to talk phones, without actually having to have one of those horrible phones. <laughs> um, and it's cooler, right? You can send video, or you can send pictures and audio and group chats and all these things to all your friends. And it uses the internet connection of your phone instead of your cell phone. Lots of people use it. Voxer had luckily for them switched over to React from another database. And then they had something happen. You see, almost every startup that pitches for venture funding draws a slide at some point. They all look the same. 
Looks like a hockey stick. This is what's going to happen. So, to our service and your money, right? It's going to go like this and then magic. It's a lie. Everybody sort of knows it's a lie. We all play the game. It, they, it turned out to be true. Um, they had both a major network mention them on the same month that a rapper began referring to boxing people. And all of a sudden, their growth was double-digit percentage every day for weeks. And the compound interest on that gets interesting really, really fast. And it turned out that they were adding React servers literally faster than their hosting provider could give them machines. As in, we had to also help them with hosting providers because they ran out of power and cooling. Um, and so the fact that you could just add machines, like we were talking before, it's just one line of go. It's a pretty big deal when you're adding 30 or 40 of them every day, which you can't want that rate forever, but some days. Um, and the availability element was a pretty big deal too, uh, but for them, you know, the time that they really got saved was the fact that they could make it over that. And so that scalability element with the availability, the only reason I mention these is that that's the things that we find to be the interesting problems we've chosen to tackle. And the reason I like to emphasize that is this whole NoSQL thing, like I talked about before the talk, is about the fact that there's not a right set of trade-offs and choices in a database system, which is a pretty complex thing. There's a lot of different trade-offs and choices we get to make. We make most of ours looking at how can we be absolutely best at availability and scalability. And we're willing to sacrifice other things to do that. We acknowledge that these things are trade-offs. So there's a bunch of use cases for which I I think earlier today, I recommended to someone in this room that they go use my people at Postgres for something, and they asked me, how do you use React? Um, my, my sales staff hates me. Um, but, you know, we, we've chosen to take some trade-offs and own them and build things based on them. And that's, you know, what we're going to keep doing. So, hopefully, even those of you that have no use for something that solves the problems React solves, Maybe one or two of the techniques or ideas I've talked about might be valuable to you somewhere else. <coughs> yes? Um, can you talk about the React customer base uh, and uh, exactly where these customers come from, like Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so the, in case it wasn't obvious, I'm not done with Q&A. Um, so <laughs> Oracle's my favorite, um, mainly because everybody's an Oracle customer and nobody's happy about it. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty darn close to just true. Uh, also, if they're already an Oracle customer, they're already used to paying a bunch of money. <laughs> so we can charge them less money and still make a lot. So yeah, that's actually where a number of conversions have come from. Um, but I'd actually say that before we even get to which systems people go from, you can really categorize into one, two big areas first. One of them are people that are suffering pain in an existing system. Right? That's hit the limits or have chosen you know, an infrastructure that ended up with the wrong trade-offs or whatever. And the others are ones that see that we've got some system with a different set of trade-offs than traditionally, and it opens up a new possibility. So we also get this class of customers that come to us because they realize that this set of choices enables them to build something they couldn't otherwise. So we get a, a decent number that aren't conversions from another database system for that reason. They came to us like, oh, I didn't do that. And then the others, it's from all over the place. We see from both from the whole raft of standard relational databases and also people that chose you know, one of the various other newer databases. Um, I think probably one of the downsides of the whole NoSQL movement is at least before all this started, most of those systems I named that were in sort of the existing monoculture, most of those systems were reasonably well understood and reasonably robust. They each have their different quirks. But when everybody's building new things and everybody gets really excited, it's also really easy to choose things that are either a really bad fit or just bad software. So here's some of that. Before we move on with the Q&A, I just want to first give a great big round of applause to Justin Sheehan. <laughs> Um, not exactly, but for this right, question, so, but it had an impact on it. 
So where where uh, uh, where would you choose to be at? Right. All right. So here's the neat bit of history here. DynamoDB. That's not an airport. It's quite tough. The service that you can use on Amazon yeah. is in no way based on Amazon's Dynamo page. Okay. It is unrelated. Um, if we took our inspiration from Dynamo, which is a system Amazon wrote that underlies their shopping cart, yeah. a few years later, I think some folks at Amazon got upset that a whole bunch of people were essentially, you know, making hay off a name that they named one of their things. And guess what? They get to name anything they want Dynamo. Sure. Um, if you look carefully at Dynamo DB, and it's API and it's guaranteed. It's very clear that it's not. You have to look carefully. It's not you're looking for. It's not based on Dynamo. What it's actually based on is a prior Amazon system called Simple DB. It's been around for a lot longer and had a bunch of limits. You know, it ran into some problems earlier than a lot of other Amazon services. And so they both changed some of the things. Like Simple DB would auto index every call all the time. But guess what? That's expensive. Some people here probably know that. Um, took away some of those things, and they deployed it on purpose-built hardware that was built for its workload. So DynamoDB is actually, we do see people that are choosing between DynamoDB and React, yeah. but they're actually more different than you might guess, because DynamoDB is based on simple DB, which is not the kind of model. It's not actually even the same bandwidth. It's really not. It's a very, very different system. Uh, sorry, yes, MCA. I noticed a couple of similarities between React and Cassandra into handoff. Uh, mm -hmm. Any high-level big differences? Or yeah, absolutely. So uh, first off, it's the right comparison. Of all the things you can compare it to, React and Cassandra have more in common than <laughs> most other pairs of you know new databases you might get. They both have that masterless infrastructure based on consistent hashing for node location. They both take some ideas from Dynamo. Um, the biggest differences, I'd say there's two. There's the things that Cassandra left out from the Dynamo model. And there's the one thing it's really interesting like that. So the things it left out were the notion of virtual nodes that I talked about before, which over time has made for a challenge at a bunch of places growing their Cassandra cluster. You can absolutely do it. I know some people have grown them quite well at large, but it, it certainly makes it harder. Uh, and they left out causality track in the form of vector clocks or anything like that. And when I talked earlier to the gentleman back there that was asking, how do we deal with these conflicting rights? If you don't store some sort of causality information with the data you store, then you are actually out of luck. And the best you can get is that one of them stops on here. So in Cassandra, if you store the same data in the same location on two machines at once, which just like React, there's nothing to stop you from doing. It. In Cassandra, the last one to land wins. And that's your only choice. In React, you, if, that's, if you're not willing to think about anything more complicated than that, you can do that. We make it possible for you to see all your data and to resolve those problems in Cassandra. Data. Now, Cassandra added one cool thing, which is that they took the data model from Google's big data. So instead of it being essentially a simple key value store, although I didn't talk about the React adds things like secondary indexing and other things like that, underlying data model of React is key value. Underlying model of Cassandra is really a two-level map. Its keys to the things inside them are sorted key value maps. So the top level is an unsorted key value map, but the value of each of those is a sorted key value map. There's a bunch of cool tricks you can play data model like that. And the tricks most commonly played are ones to get around the problem I was talking about before, where people will always write to new keys instead of ever overwriting. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions. We can take them offline if you want. Uh, one is I just wanted to ask why you said that um, right head logging is slow. Because it seems like the problematic part of most databases uh, is actually just the random writes in the structure. And right head logging, you can just get a battery back to cache and deal with that. Yep, you had two. The second one is um, I, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about how secondary indexes work. Um, sure. Especially with like the. You're, you're doing all this hashing. Yeah, it's, it's a trick. What are you actually bringing? So the first one is that right head logging is not fundamentally slow. It's I/O contention slows down the chain. So it's that it's if you're doing a bunch of random writes and a sequential write over here, this one essentially is now random writes also. Right? Yeah, Don't get me wrong. You can. It's not much worse. It's not worse. Sure. The idea is if you can only if you can choose to do only one of those instead of both, it's better. But it's absolutely the case that you can get. Pretty darn screaming performance if you're careful and you know what you're doing out of a system that 
We can experiment with algorithms. We can test correctness. We can create tests that are better than your tests. Um, and I can explain what I mean by that. They give us the confidence to rip and replace three algorithms in a week to solve a problem. And one of those will be faster than the other two. And if you didn't get to try all three, you lost. So, also it's not a fundamentally slow language. There are a few things it's not that fast at. Uh, don't try to do much matrix mapping. Don't try to do interesting floating point. Uh, it's a compiled language with a VM, right? In terms of the general notion of the way the language runs, it's more similar to Java than anything else. It's not the same VM, but it's a similar model. And go tell people that it's impossible to write fast Java code. You'll have a fun day. <laughs> so I can connect to that. Uh, so uh, what do you do when, when how, how does it degrade in terms of uh, performance as you increase the load of your existing cluster? What do you do when, when, when memory becomes scarce? Uh, what is your worst case performance in terms of variance of period of time? Yeah, absolutely. So we try to err on the side of being having as few surprises in that curve over time as possible. The downside of that is that at the minimal cases, the simplest cases, we lose. Right? We do not have a system that will go as fast as possible when we are resource rich. Uh, so you know there are a bunch of databases that are essentially in-memory databases that just don't tell you that until you run it. Um, and the short, the simple thing here is that with React, there are a few choices, and there work to make these choices. So for instance, I talked about Bitcast a bit. It's one of the storage engines. React actually, more like Postgres than a lot of other databases this way, has this notion of pluggable storage. My SQL is this way too, but we got that way a little later. It's a little different. Um, you can choose your storage engine and get really different behavior and performance, right? So much like MySQL doesn't have a performance profile until you talk about you know, whether you're using NoDB or you know, how you've tuned that and so on, it's similar with React. The thing we strive for is that no matter what like, the standard choices you make, you don't get a shocking degradation, which means, you know, for instance, we don't uh, you know, just say MMAP the whole database in, which works out great when your database is less than two gigs. So there's a bunch of things we don't do. Um, so one of the things that means is that you know we sometimes don't get looked at because it's not the fastest system. We do everything we can do in the first few hours, but it rarely uh, degrades more aggressively than your current degradation of resources. So what people tend to see, and we've done a few blogs in the past, and some other users have too. Giant did one a few years ago, showing you know both smooth increase and smooth decrease in behavior. I'm not sure how to answer that more clearly without getting into tons of which choices. I'm thinking more things like like Cassandra and uh, the garbage collection. So mm. if you have garbage collection in yep. line, but you probably have much less of it because of that. Yeah, absolutely. So in that particular case, this is one of the advantages we got out of rolling instead of the, anything on the JVM, is the garbage collection model. And here, there's two different kinds of garbage collection you can mean in a system like this. There's the one in the VM that the database is written in, if you've written in a language like Java or Erlang. And then there's garbage collection that, in the sense that lots of databases call vacuuming or whatever, right? Reclaiming no longer used space. Both of those are interesting for both of these systems. Um, one of the problems a lot of people have with Java with high performance servers like Cassandra is you gotta be a real wizard at the JVM to not have periodic GC pauses that essentially stop the world for seconds. That kind of stinks in a high performance distributed system. Erlang, by running everything in these tiny processes and giving them an overall heap to actually do garbage collection per process one at a time. And the whole system actually never halts. There is no stop the world GC. There's stop for a stop process, process that's not running now anyway. Um, and then there's the database kind of garbage collection. The advantage we get there is by having, just as you brought up Cassandra, it's an easy, now I have something to compare against. Um, by having things like virtual nodes, we can at least amortize that. We don't get to get out of the pain. If you use a, a back end, that does, in fact, require vacuum of any kind. Um, we don't get to get out of it, we can amortize it. We can have it be per one V node at a time, instead of one whole server at a time. Um, and so, again, a certain amount of necessary IO, but we can at least make it not be one giant spike. That's what we do. Thank you. That's all the time we have for questions, but Justin will be here for a one on one question forever, as he's got a chance. Uh, thank you very much, Justin Sheehy, CTO.